this is chapter 13, recording three. Uh, for opioid overdose for special consideration or resuscitation circumstances, if naloxone was administered by a bystander prior to your arrival, then determine how much of the medication was given and by the route which it was given. The recommendation algorithm for implementing naloxone into cardiac arrest management sequence is discussed in chapter 21, so toxicology. So we'll go over that later. But standard resuscitation measures take priority over naloxone administration, so keep that in mind. Cardiac arrest and pregnancy priorities are to provide high quality CPR and relieve pressure off the aorta and via cava. If a pregnant patient is not in cardiac arrest, then position them on their left side to relieve pressure on those great vessels. If she is in cardiac arrest and the top of the patient's uterus can be felt at or above the level of the belly button, the umbilicus, perform manual displacement of the uterus to the patient's left to relieve aorta caval compression while CPR is being performed. So, just push that big old belly off to the left side if possible while you're doing CPR. Family members may experience a psychological crisis that turns into a medical crisis. Family members and loved ones will remember this event in detail for the rest of their lives. So appropriate and supportive care at the onset of grief may positively affect the family's grieving process. Keep the family informed throughout the resuscitation process. Designate one provider to communicate to the patient's family and let them know the patient's status. Be concise and clear when you are giving information to the family. Never give false senses of hope. Never say they're going to make it, don't worry about it, because they very well may not. So just be very clear and honest in what you are telling them. After the resuscitation has stopped, these other measures can be helpful. Take the family to a quiet private place. Introduce yourself and anyone with you. Use clear language and speak in a warm, sensitive, and caring manner. Try and exhibit calm, reassuring authority. Use the patient's name. Use eye contact and appropriate touch. Expect the family members will show emotion as they begin the grieving process. Um, while you are still on scene, be supportive, but don't hover over the patient. And then ask if a friend or family member can be called to come and help support them. When you need to leave, turn the family over to someone else, for example, a police officer. Ensure that children are not ignored. Um, see Chapter 2, Workforce Safety and Wellness, for a discussion of the emotional aspects of the emergency care and stress management for you, because this may be traumatic for you as well, and you may need some support. Um, it's okay for the family to see the patient, even though they're deceased, and they may choose to. Um, they may want you to recount an entire recap of what you did for the patient and why you did what you did. Um, children may want to spend time with family members that are deceased. That's okay. They can touch them. Um, if it's a coroner case, we just typically ask that they leave all of our interventions in place but they can go ahead and touch, they can hold the hand, um, just make sure that you give them that time and that sense. For education and training for the EMT, CPR skills can deteriorate over time, so practice often using mannequin-based training. CPR self-instruction through a video or computer-based modules with hands-on practice may be a reasonable alternative to instructor-led courses. You have to recertify every two years when you do your CPR, so make sure that you keep that up. It is important, and yes, it's not like riding a bike. Sometimes things change, and they change frequently and rapidly in our field, so you need to make sure that you're keeping up your skills so that you can give the patient the best care that you can. For education and training for the public, remember that you are a patient advocate. Not only are you responsible for providing the best possible care for your patient, but you must do your part to facilitate the training of lay people in the critical skills of CPR and AED operation. If you are asked to train members of your community how to perform compressions only CPR, you should consider it your professional responsibility and be willing to assist. So we do a lot of training for community members because we need as many people as possible trained in CPR so that they can assist us. So if you're asked to be a part of that, make sure that you take your responsibility very seriously. And this is the last recording for chapter 13.